Hey and welcome back to freephotoshop.com and video 6 of this series looking at the levels command inside Adobe Photoshop. In the previous video we looked at adjusting the levels of an image using the composite view. Here we're going to start making our modifications on a channel by channel basis which gives us far more control over the way the image will ultimately look. I'm going to start off here by hitting Control alt o here on the PC, that's Command Option O on the Mac to open up the bridge and I'm going to double left click on this image here entitled Grand Canyon North Rim which is a photograph taken at the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona and it's a photograph taken from the South Rim actually so the camera is actually pointed towards the North Rim hence the name of the photograph and before we look at how we can improve the shot you'll notice that I'm viewing this at the 100% view size which is indicated down here in the document window. Now I go into much more detail on the point of image size and resolution inside my tutorial that's cleverly named here on freephotoshop.com called Image Size and Resolution. But just to summarize right here and now for the benefit of anyone who hasn't seen that yet, at the 100% view size you're previewing the image with one image pixel being represented by one screen pixel. So in other words, you're getting to see every pixel that the image contains. Now sometimes you can't fit the entire image onto screen at the 100% view size, so you'll have to zoom away from the image. Now that's fine, in fact it's a pretty common practice because digital images and photographs in general are so large these days, uh, the megapixel rating on cameras is increasing almost by the month now. And if you are needing to zoom out, as you probably will be, then you're much better keeping the zoom ratio at as low a multiple of 100 as you can. So what I'm trying to say I guess is that the 50%, the 25% or even the 12.5% here are all good zoom ratios to use. What you don't want to do is end up using something like this 33.33% view size because it's a very difficult ratio to render to screen so you're not going to be getting a smooth, accurate preview of what the image really looks like. Anything over 100%, by the way, is fine. It's just when you zoom closer than 100% that the problems begin. Anyhow, I'm going to return to the 100% view size, and now we can focus on the Grand Canyon North Rim photograph that we opened up just a few moments ago. And I'd say that this image is a little washed away in that it lacks contrast, it also lacks a lot of brightness values which makes the image look fairly dull and it's also got this bluish cast across it. So we're going to fix all of that right here inside this tutorial. Now cast your mind back to tutorial number two where we looked at the auto functions. Auto contrast was just an automatic version of what we did in the last tutorial where we adjusted the brightness values on a composite basis throughout the image whereas the auto levels and auto color commands adjusted the brightness levels in each of the three color channels. So if I go ahead and apply the auto contrast command by hitting Control alt shift l here on the PC or Command option shift l that will be on the Mac, then we improve the brightness levels of the image just a touch, but we do nothing with the blue cast because with the auto contrast feature, we're only able to affect the image on a composite basis. Now I'm going to hit Control or Command Z to undo that because we'll want to avoid applying multiple versions of the levels command on top of each other. Then I'm going to hit Control Shift L here on the PC or Command Shift L on the Mac to apply the auto levels command and this time we're working on a channel by channel basis. And even though this is just an automated command, we're getting some really good results. I'm going to hit Control or Command Z once again to undo the auto levels modification and hopefully from that you'll see the difference between working on a composite basis as we did with the auto contrast option and working inside the channels as we did with the auto levels option in this instance. Now as I said auto levels and also the auto color command for that matter do a great job with this particular photograph but we can do a better job by manually adjusting the brightness levels of the image inside the free color channels. I'm going to hit Control L or Command L on the Mac to bring up the levels controls. And you can see that by messing around in the composite histogram, 
by shifting around the input values of the shadows, highlights and midtones, we're not really getting anywhere. Now you're probably thinking that we've already looked at that with the auto contrast option, and you'd be right. But what this is going to enable me to do is just demonstrate a way in which you can reset the values inside levels without actually leaving the dialog box. So if you hold down the Alt key here on the PC or the Option key on the Mac, then this Council button changes into a Reset button. And I'm going to go ahead and click it. And now I've reset all the values to what they were when I first entered the dialog box. And you'll find that this little trick applies to many other commands here inside of Photoshop, so it's definitely worth knowing. Now like I said earlier, the colour issues we've got with this image seem to be with the blues. So naturally we're going to want to start things off here inside the blue channel. So we'll start off by switching to that blue channel if you haven't done already. And I'm going to Alt or Option drag the black slider that of course controls the shadows until I reach the value of say around about 59. And you can see that by holding down the Alt or Option key we're getting a live preview of exactly what colours will be clipped inside this channel. So in other words we're seeing what pixels are going to turn pure blue in the blue channel. Now although we've already discussed clipping and agreed hopefully that it's generally a bad thing, sometimes you'll find that it's a necessary evil. Because this image has a very dark shadow here in the foreground, and that shadow has a very pronounced blue tint to it, you'll find that any real corrections we're applying to make this whole image look better will detrimentally affect this area of shadows in the foreground. Unfortunately that's just something we're going to have to accept. OK, you'll notice that we've placed the black slider just before the beginning of this little hump that leads into the bulk of the midtones. And I'm going to go ahead and do the same to the highlights. I'm also going to use the Alt or Option key just as another slant of things inside the image. And once again, we're seeing a live preview of the clipping that's occurring inside the highlights of this image. I'd say around about 230 is a good value here. Now one of the most difficult aspects of working inside the channels is that you really need to make your adjustments to all three channels before you start to see any positive change. As in this case we've made our approximate corrections in the blue channel, so by squeezing the shadows and highlights sliders closer together we've actually stretched out the brightness levels to fill the actual 256 different brightness values inside this channel. Now I'm going to switch to the green channel I'm going to Alt or Option drag the shadows until we're getting the same kind of clipping as in the blue channel. Again you can see the dark spot in the corner turn into green which indicates clipping. But I'd say a value of 33 works well here. Now I'll Alt or Option drag the highlights and you can see that if we bring the slider up to this little first peak here we start clipping greens in the sky. And we don't want to do that, so I'm going to back up to a value here of around about 214. That looks pretty good there. We don't know for sure, of course, until we've made changes to the red channel as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to enter the red channel via the drop-down menu. And I'll Alt or Option drag the shadows once again, looking to bring the slider up to this first little hill in the histogram. And at that point, we're starting to see the line between necessary clipping and unnecessary clipping. So we'll leave this set to 35 I'd say and then we'll drag the highlights in and this time I'm going to keep an eye on the image and leave the highlight set to a value of around about 207 does a pretty good job in this case. Okay well if you look at the image that's definitely an improvement on what we started with here but we're not done yet. Now we have to decide on whether we want to go with this image and don't be alarmed to find yourself going in and out of channels multiple times just to tweak things. That's a fairly common practice. In fact, I'd go as far to say that it's a necessary practice here inside Levels. Now looking at the image, as I said before, I'd say we've done a pretty good job so far. And we can get a good idea of how far we've come by turning off the preview checkbox and see the image minus any Levels adjustments we're currently adding and then tick the box once again to see our modifications and that looks pretty good. Now I'd already played with this image before I started recording this tutorial so I knew the values I wanted 
but if I hadn't seen this image then I might have wanted to drag the sliders to the edges of the histogram, got an idea of what was happening and then gone into the channels to make the finer alterations. But believe me, it's not always going to be as easy as what we've just done here. In other words, I made it look easy because I already had an idea of what I wanted to do with the values inside each channel. But things like this come with time and practice, and of course a lot of patience. And also it's important to note that there are no magic values. Every image will respond differently to the levels command because its brightness values will be distributed in different ways. Okay, now this photograph was taken at the Grand Canyon of course, so I want to finish things off here by making the image slightly more yellow to match the true appearance of the rocks at the canyon. And I can do that in a couple of ways. First of all we have to decide whereabouts in the tonal range we want to make the changes. And in this case we definitely don't want to make the changes to the shadows or highlights. We don't want to make the shadows and highlights more yellow. So that leaves just the midtones. Now as I said we have two ways of tackling this. First of all we don't have the luxury of a designated yellow channel here inside the RGB colour space. If we were working inside say CMYK then we would have that option but here inside of RGB we don't. So how can we increase the yellow I hear you ask? Well, like I said, we have two ways to go. Remember back in the third tutorial of this series, we looked at colour theory here inside the RGB colour space. And to make the yellow light, we had to shine the red and green lights together. Well, that's all we need to do here. We can bump up the gamma or midtone values inside the red and green channels to increase the intensity of light inside the midtones of both of those channels and therefore produce yellow. The other way is to subtract blue from the image because if you're taking away blue light then naturally you're increasing the ratio of red and green light which will not only reduce the blue but increase the amount of yellow. So let's make sure we're working inside the red channel and then we can select the gamma value in the middle here and then bump it up to 1.1. We'll then go into the green channel to do the same. So we have a gamma value of 1.1 in both the red and green channels which as you can see from the preview is making the photograph look a much more satisfying yellow. And the secret here is to make slight changes at a time. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the composite view here and you'll notice that the histogram is looking very jaggy. It's looking as if bits are missing from parts of the histogram itself. And it's definitely nowhere near as smooth as it was when we first started. Well, that's just the result of stretching out those shadows and highlights which we've been doing inside this tutorial. And we've quite literally torn the histogram apart, but be assured that it's all for the good of whatever image you happen to be working on. Okay, I'm happy with this modification, so I'm going to hit the OK button here to accept the changes. We'll be looking at non-destructive applications of the levels command a little later on in this series, but for now those changes are permanent. Sure, you can hit Ctrl or Command Z to undo them, but you can't re-edit them on the fly. And just to prove my point there, I'm going to open up the Levels command once again, and you can see that those values that we spent oh so long entering are now reset to a standard 256 level histogram. So I'm going to cancel my way out of there and hit Ctrl or Command Z to see what the image looked like before the Levels command, and then hit it once again to see the adjustments we've made. And isn't it amazing just how far we've come? Once again, this is before and this is after. And that's amazing. I find that just unbelievable, really. All thanks to a channel by channel modification of brightness values using the levels command here inside of Photoshop. In the next video, we're going to continue our coverage of channels inside levels and we're going to mix it up with some must-know keyboard shortcuts that would you believe are actually easier to remember than forget. Well thanks as always for joining me here at freephotoshop.com, I'll see you in the next video.